elevate the Nitzotzer Kedusha, that's, that's what it's all about, meaning that everything we do, the whole concept of Malacha, Malacha itself is the idea of work, right, creative activity, and we know there are 39 that are forbidden on Shabbos, that we can't do on Shabbos, but to the Mishkan, which is a story to itself, which we'll have to get to at some point in time as well, but as the base of Mikdash, but the basic idea is that everything we do in this world, every act, and not just every act physically, but even the thinking that we do and the speech that we do, as the lesson points out, everything performs beer on some level, meaning that we're, we're constantly rectifying the world by our very existence. Hopefully, we're rectifying. If we're not, if we're not being the var and the if we're not doing the thing properly, uh, well, the truth is we're still elevate, we're still drawing out the sparks, we're still separate the sparks, as we mentioned before, because even a chet, a sin, requires Natsotzi Kiddusha. No one can live in this world without, without Natsotzi Kiddusha. The most evil people of history who have done the most evil things have had to use Natsotzi Kiddusha, holy sparks, to be able to do it. The only thing is, though, is that once they've been used for evil, they cannot go back to Shemaim where they belong just like that. They have to be cleaned off first, which basically means either the person wakes up to their sin while there's still time and does tshuva, or they will have to go through an onish process, a, a rectification, cleansing process, which has to do with the person's onish. It's a whole, a whole procedure, a whole process that uh, takes place in creation, which we're familiar with on a superficial level, but Kabbalistically, it's actually a very, very deep, deep concept and idea. Anyhow, the main thing over here is that the Tzotzi Kiddush, that's the, that's, the, that's the time of history. That we, now, the world uses clocks, conventional means of telling time, but uh, we specifically should be using the Tzotzi Kedusha. That's the that those are the real that's the real passage of time. Time is measured by the Tzotzi Kedusha, uh, meaning that the, how many sparks are elevated determines where we're holding historically, and ultimately speaking, how many sparks have to be elevated by a specific point in time in history. That if they're not elevated by that time, then creation or Kodesh Baruch Hu, God will do things in such a way as to cause them to be elevated. Uh, either because of us or through us, and usually not in the most pleasant of means, because human beings, if they're not buying into something, have to be forced to do that, which has to be done. And, uh, you know, on that topic, we're watching something take place right before our very eyes. I mean, on a, on a small picture you know, level, the way that we look at things, what's going on right now, for example, the economy, the world economy, and specifically right now, the European economy, what's taking place with Greece, uh, the referendum and uh, the shakiness of the European community financially, which also means politically as well, but uh, not just there, but in the States as well. In fact, I was just told recently, just in fact today, before this, uh, before this session, that a woman who had gone to the bank to open up an account, or not to actually, to, to transfer money, she already had the account opened up. The, the bank teller told her, the person who opened up, the, the Paquita told her, to, you know, who he, she was dealing with said, you know, if you'd come to me just yesterday, I would not have been able to open, open an account for you. You know, from that point onward, you know, you're lucky you already have an account because the American government is now clamping down and making it very difficult to open foreign accounts. They're going after foreign, foreign funds of American citizens. And uh, as of January, I believe it's going to be difficult to buy stocks in another country. Because the states is desperate financially, they're desperate right now. It's it's obvious. It's completely clear. But there's this illusion that we live in. It's often been said that if countries were individuals, they would have been shut down a long time ago. The average country today is bankrupt. The states is also bankrupt, meaning that the amount of debt they have is the trains of dollars and getting worse by the day, by the moment, by the second. Just downtown, you can watch the debt get larger in uh, downtown New York. Um, they have a big, huge sign that tells you this, the momentary changing of the of the debt, and uh, the only thing is that countries have to go on. Individuals, you can shut down. Businesses, you can shut down because just like new ones, you know, are opening up all the time, old ones or even new ones that didn't survive are shutting down all the time because that's the way it works in the business world. You can't can't keep all the businesses alive. It's up to the individual to try to do that and the economy to try and do that. But you can allow businesses to shut down. You can't allow too many businesses to shut down. But you can allow some to shut down. But countries, you know, to shut a country down, you're talking about, about millions of people, tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people. You can't just shut down. So the country has to go on. The show has to go on, as they say, right? And uh, you have to shop until you drop because if you don't, then basically consumer confidence is eroded and the whole economy tanks. And then you have worldwide crisis, the beginning of which we saw back in 2009. With the the stock market crash and the whole thing to do with the uh, the, the bad investments, the 
in the uh, in the uh, housing market. But all of that is, you know, it's part of a pattern, in a sense. It's part of a trend, but it's not really because even the trends are just Hashem's way of hiding His hand, Hashkach Pratis. The reality is, is that uh, everything is a function of Hashkach Pratis of divine providence. If something is happening, especially if it affects the Jewish people and the direction they're going, then by definition, it means that God is forcing the issue. So all of a sudden it becomes difficult to transfer funds out of the states to foreign countries, and perhaps at some point in time we have to be concerned about things like social security checks and just money leaving the states. They're already trying to get money back that has been out of the states and, and get businesses back into the states again because they need every single dollar they can get. We've had a a great, a great run until now. The United States of America has been an extremely generous country in terms of what it's allowed its citizens to do, and not just its citizens, but even foreign citizens. For example, 36.org, which is my personal organization, which, which runs uh, the umbrella for all of this work that's being done, is an American uh, tax, uh, tax exempt organization. It's a non-profit organization in the States that allows me to be able to, to collect funds in the States and give tax receipts to people who live in the States, American tax receipts, all legal, everything the way it's supposed to be done. An American accountant to make sure it's all kosher. And, uh, but for how much longer? How much longer will we be able to do things like that? How much longer will we be able to raise money in the States and sell books and things like that in the States and then transfer the money out of the States, places like Israel, especially if Israel becomes an international pariah, which is the direction they're going, as the UN basically gears itself to, to declare acceptance of a Palestinian state, regardless of the fact that the Palestinians will not accept the conditions of peace. Of course, they can't, and they won't. But uh, that's the direction this is going. That's the, the that's the divine providence picture. That's the big picture is like that's God doing all that to force the issues, and all, ultimately to force issues regarding the Jewish people. And when we spoke about the past, the idea of the door closing on Kibbutz Galios phase number one, the the final stages of the first phase, not even the first phase, but an advanced phase of the ingathering of the exiles. We the Jewish people have been living around the world since World War II. We were successful in many of the countries we lived in to such an extent that we were able to, to not only settle down but actually build up funds, support Eretz Israel, and even perhaps buy places or invest in Eretz Israel and or put money away for the future that we might do that and make Aliyah on our own terms. People sold their houses and got relatively good prices and, they, and then whatever money they saved up if they were able to save up and made Aliyah. They began life anew here. It wasn't always easy the transition, it wasn't always easy to survive here. That's where the, the classic joke came. How do you make a million dollars in Israel? You come with two, right? And uh, it's a little bit lush and hard like, but it's also describing a reality that it was not easy to make money here, but you survived. You survived. And you survive on a different level. It's not this is not America in Eretz Israel. This is Eretz Hakadosh. This is a place that we're supposed to connect to Kosh and materialism takes a second, you know, a back seat over here compared to, at least until Mashiach comes, but takes a back seat, you know, compared to what it did back in America, where that was kind of like the primary reality. And it doesn't mean that you cannot have a good life here, because Baruch Hashem, there's no question, people are living a good life here. Many people. Unfortunately, there's a lot of poverty too. You can always find that, and, and you can't not recognize that reality. But people who make Aliyah, many of them, many of them have come and, and made a good life here. The bigger question is what's happening? What's happening to the world economy? What's happening right now, you know, with Greece and, uh, you know, how it's affecting the stock market and how it's affecting the entire European community and the euro, the future of the euro. And even though we live with this illusion that countries will somehow be able to survive everything, there's somehow they just pull them, you know, themselves through it. It may be difficult. It may be you know, complicated. But uh, a country's not a business. It has to go on. And that's not necessarily true which is one of the reasons why we have major wars like World War One and World War Two, because when, when the facts, which do not lie, you can fake them, and you can lie about them, but they have a way of showing up. Just like a, a person who, God forbid, is seriously ill, but chooses to ignore it for the time being, as if by doing that, because he feels good, okay, right, feels okay right now, that somehow it will mystically disappear. It does not mystically disappear. At some point in time, the person will start showing signs of being ill. And eventually it may happen so much down the road that by that time it's too, it's too late to admit the problem in terms of being able to deal with it. Likewise, when it comes to financial facts, the same thing is true as well, that, uh, that the, the reality of the numbers will catch up 
And the government knows that. And the, pe the economists are aware of that. And the people who are honest with themselves are, are real with that. And that's why some people are actually responding to it and taking you know, measures right now including the United States government, which means, you know, pulling in money. And even though, you know, people who might have thought of making Aliyah at some point in time and had been, you know, saving towards it and planning for it, may find it impossible to do so now without leaving everything behind. You know, maybe now it will become difficult at some point in time. Maybe you, you just can't leave the borders of the United States of America because you're manpower, especially if you're healthy and you're young. Who knows how far things will go? We've seen the world go to extremes. In extreme situations, man goes to extremes. And that has a major impact on the Jewish people. And as we're all standing back and scratch your heads, like, what, what's going on over here? How, how is this possible? Whoever dreamed this would ever become the reality. That's the way it works. And it's all to do with Netzotzi Kedusha. And nobody teaches this lesson better than Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu was forced to go into exile. Yeah, he had to go into exile in order to survive his brother Esau. In order to be able to uh, to you know to to go on with his life, because after taking the bechor and then literally stealing the brochas right from underneath Esav's nose, it was like a revolving door. As as Esav came in, Yaakov went out with the brochas, and from his father Yitzchak was blind at that time on the command of his mother Rivka. And even though that uh, you know it was all mesudar and the way it had to be for hashgachah reasons, nonetheless hashgachah pratis forced. Yaakov into, into Chutzlar. He had to run for his life. He had to flee for his life. His parents told him to get out of this place because Esau is going to kill you. And second of all, you need to go get yourself a wife for two or three or four and, and go to Padana Ram, to my, you know, my uncle, you know, my brother's house, Uncle Lavan, your Uncle Lavan, right, who is, is as black as they come. You know, his name is White, but you know, this guy is like black across the board. He's a Ramai, he's a trickster. But Yaakov has to contend with the entire time for 20 years and survive that. And uh, he's forced to go. And why? Because they're, they're Natsotsi Kedusha. Just like Lot had to go down to Stom to get the spark of David Melech out by marrying a woman from Stom and then having daughters and eventually there's Aleppo's of the mountains where eventually Moab is born and eventually Rus is born who converts back into the Jews. And that's, that's the trail of an Natsotsi Kedush that has to leave the Klippas, the negative reality of, of, of Tuma. And make its way back to Kedusha in a very uh, backwards, winding way because the Jewish people are in Zecha to bring Mashiach the proper, straightforward way. Just like, you know, it's similar in terms of what's happened over the last 60, 70 years. It's not the Torah Jews who, who took this country and built it up. We have built up the Bate Knesset, Baruch Hashem. We built up the Bate Midrashas, the places to learn, to study. The communities are growing. Baruch Hashem, but we're using materials and we're using technology that was brought in by the secular government, that was brought in by secular Jews, and the infrastructure that which we benefit from is was, was not set up by I mean the team perhaps and, and religious Zionists, but but not uh, not you know the most strictly you know Torah abiding Jews necessarily, although you have on both sides all kinds, but it's not the way that one might have imagined it. And the, the Arizal explains, that's called Mimus of Tachbos, because when we don't merit to bring the Gula a straightforward way, it has to come through a back the way to fool the Sitra Achra into believing it's not really taking place when in fact it's taking place in stages. That's the way the Arizal explains it. But Yaakov is forced to go into Galus, and he flees to, to Chutzlarts, and he realizes he went past Har HaMariah, which is the future Makam of the base of Mikdash, as, as Avram points out, Hashem Yireh, this is the place Hashem is going to be seen, which he says in next week's parasha, parashas, uh, parashas Bayer and the Akeda, and uh, he goes back. So Kosh does a miracle, does a nace, and the miracle is the land shrinks, or he's able to get back faster than he would be physically, and uh, the result is that uh, you know, he's able to dove him there, but Kosh who wants him to sleep there, so he makes the sunset early, and uh, he doves Mari, so he's, he's, he's metakin Mari, he establishes Mari as part of the, the daily prayer service, and he sleeps and has his famous dream of the Sulam, of the ladder. And he has, you know, the angels going up, the angels going down, as the Medrash points out, there's the angel of, of Bavl, the angel of Madai, the angel of, of Yavan, right, which is not doing so well right now, which is why Greece is not doing so well right, right, so well right now, more than likely it's on its last legs, so Greece is also kind of on its last legs, but, uh, and then Edom, 
right? And the the malach, and they all go they all go up and they all come down to indicate that you know the amount of rungs that go up is the amount of years the exile is going to last potentially, and then they come down to indicate that the gulls will come to an end, the Jewish people will conquer them and get out, right? So Yaakov is invited to go up as well, and he refuses because he's afraid they're just like they went up and came down. So he will also come down, and the major says because Yaakov refused to go up that we had to go through the four exiles predicted in this dream. Anybody he wakes up the next morning, and he's in total shock, and he says, you know, this place is awesome. This is an awesome place, a totally awesome place. I didn't know how awesome it was, I and mean, I came back because it was awesome. That's why I came back in the first place. But I didn't know how awesome it was, and, and not, it's a base of Lukim. It's the Shar Shemaim. It's all these wonderful things that, I, of course, I should have known about anyhow in the first place, but for some reason now it's a Kiddush to him. And, uh, and then, he, then he, he makes a vow. He takes, he takes a netter. And he says, uh, if God will go with me to Galus and to Chutzlarts and take care of me and feed me and clothe me and all that and protect me and bring me back to my father's house, and surely he's my God. I mean, he's always your God. <laughs> what, what kind of condition is that? Who, who, who makes a statement like that? We don't, we don't say things like that. No matter what we go through, we have to have a moon that Kosh Bokos are God. God we, statements like Gamz Latova exist because things happen to us in ways that we feel totally unprotected, we feel totally abandoned, we feel totally, you know, without any uh, divine support, and we know it's, it's not true, it's just the way it appears to us, and we say, Gamz to say, this too is for the good. So what is Yaakov saying? Gamz you know, eradicates a statement. So what is he saying? And this is an af. This is a Baal B'tachon. This is somebody who doesn't seem to go in and out of B'tachon like the rest of us might. He's a Baal B'tachon. He, he owns B'tachon. He's like, it's, it's, it's his Metzius. This is his Mahus. It's his reality. So, what's he saying? Why, and, and how did the dream change all that? Why all of a sudden now? Why not when he left home the first time, he didn't say that? Only now. Right? What's the point of this vow? So, the Medrash says, and this is hugely important, that Yaakov, yeah, he knew that it was Shar Shema, and he knew it was the gate of heaven, because that's obviously why he came back in the first place, to Davinia, because it's the gate of heaven. But he also thought that that. Everywhere there's a gate of heaven. You look up into the Shemaim, anywhere in the world, you know, the sky is dark, you've got stars, you know, it looks like a straight path. If I daven in Yushalayim, so my tefillahs go to Shemaim. If I daven in Syria, you know, if I can somehow do that safely, then my tefillahs go to, to Shemaim. If I go to America, then of course my, my learning, all the Kedusha that I generate should go to Shemaim. And therefore, I'm okay. I can learn anywhere in the world. Okay, I can't learn in a a makam tum, I can't learn an impure place that I can't do because that directly feeds, feeds the klipus. That's not a good thing. And, and I can't learn, and I can't do you know, certain mitzvahs like eating on Yom Kippur because that's going to feed the klipus. And it's not, it's not open game to do you know, long-term mitzvahs, but certainly you know, the, under the right circumstances, all the kedusha I generate, all the nitzotzi kedusha that I elevate and I, I spiritually separate, separate out from the klipus from my learning and my mitzvahs and I elevate, surely they go right to Shemaim, wherever I am. That seems to be so obvious. And then Yaakov finds that it's not true. The Medrash says that Yaakov saw the angels of Israel go up, you know, the Sulam there, and the angels of Chutzlart come down the Sulam there. So the question is, why didn't the angels of, of Chutzlart come down the Sulam someplace else? In other countries, because every country has its own angel. Every country is governed by a specific angel. If the angel survives, the country survives. If the angel dies, the country dies in the end. So, so if, if, if the angels of Chutzlar are meant to accompany Yaakov Avinu into, into Galus, into the diaspora, let them come down over their respective countries. Why must they come down over Israel? So the Madrash says, and Tuva Aretz explains specifically in the, the, the Shema Rizal, that that's because it turns out that not only is Israel a Shar Shemaim, but Eretz Yisrael is the only Shar Shemaim, and the Sulam, the latter that the Torah speaks about, is actually a spiritual reality about six to eight feet wide, Dalit Amis, that, that follows the entire border of Eretz Yisrael all the way from bottom to top up to Shemaim. Meaning that any Kedusha generated by anybody down here has to first travel to Eretz Yisrael before going up, and any Kedush coming back from Shemaim to man, for example, Hashem, you daven for Parnassah, so Hashem is not going to respond to your, your davening by giving you a bracha of Parnassah. 
any any brook coming back into the world from Shemaim has to come down first over to Israel and then then go out to wherever you are in the world. The further you are, the further it has to travel. And that was a chiddush. It is a chiddush. I mean, most people don't think in those terms. It's it's. I mean, how can that be? But that's the reality. So that's what Yaakov wakes up and he says, "Wow, <laughs> I didn't know that before." That's a chim-. and then he gets nervous, and then he gets scared. Because he says to himself, well, that's the case. Wait a second, wait a second, hold on. I will go to Lavan's house, Uncle Lavan, right? And I'm going to daven there, and I'm going to bench there, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, you, know, you know, to learn there, and raise my kids there, and we're going to be generating all kinds of kedusha. And, and what's going to happen? It's going to go up, and the Tzotzi move will be drawn out of the, of the klipus of Mesopotamia, and they're going to go up, and then and then what? They have to go to Teres Israel. So how does that happen? They don't go by FedEx. They don't go by, by postal service. They get handed over from one angel of one country to the next angel of the next country, and to the next angel to finally get to the angel of Israel, who then sends it back to Shemai, which is a problem. Because if that's going to happen, that means every angel of Chutzlarts, which by definition is an angel from the side of Tuma, only the angel of Eretz Yisrael, Mechayel, of course, Borch over him, is from the side of Kedusha. The other ones are all from the side of Tuma, and the Rizal you know, explains which countries are governed by which angel from Tuma. And they will take, as is natural, as, as they want to do, right, some of the Kedusha, that's also Kedusha, you know, they've got to be paid along the way, weakening the Kedusha I generate and strengthening the Klippus. I, says Yaakov Vidnu, will go to Chutzlart and do what? I'm going to feed the Klippus? Up until now, I was only doing a mitzvah of Kibbutz of Aim and protecting my life, that, you know? But now it turns out I'm going to go there and protect my life, but, but, but strengthen the Klippus? I'll endanger the whole world. They get so strong, they'll be, you know, a Holocaust guy. They'll destroy the world, but grounds, whatever. Unacceptable. But I can't go back home. But I can't go to Chutzlart. So he comes up with a patent. He comes up with an idea. He says, if, if I'm going and I'm going to Shem Shemayim, then I'm taking the Shechina with me. Okay? I'm, I'm going to take, you know, the Shechina will have to go with me. And that's the vow he takes. That's the netter he makes. He says, if God will go with me into Chutzlar to protect me and take care of me, meaning that all the Kedush I generate will not go to Lavan and the Klippos more than is due to them, Ki'ilu as if, and here's the Chiddush, there's a major Chiddush over here, Ki'ilu the borders of Israel extend themselves to incorporate me even in diaspora, because physically you can't do that unless you conquer the land, but spiritually you can do that because the spiritual reality can do all kinds of things, but physical reality cannot. I'll believe you should cap that, catch up to each other eventually. Right? But but that's you know that's what he says. Then I can go. Then I will know I'm safe. And that's what Lavin says. Lavin tries, you know, tries to break through the the Kippa HaBarzel, the spiritual Kippa HaBarzel, to get at you know, Yaakov and to, to, I know, you know, Arami Ovedavi, right, the Aramite, you know, who, who wanted to kill my father because that's what he wanted to do. I don't mind keeping Rochel Leah alive and my grandchildren, but this Yaakov guy, he's going to destroy him. He's an anti-Semite, right? Halachihi, Esav, son is Yaakov, Lavan, son is Yaakov, and just about everybody else in the whole world. His son is Yaakov, does not like Yaakov. So the Shechina going to Galus with Yaakov Avinu, that's what made possible his safety, not just his safety, but it made possible Yaakov to be able to not only survive there, but to thrive there. Because when the Shechina goes into Galus, it goes specifically to help us pull out the Netzot Kedush that we were sent in the first place to get. That under better circumstances, they would have been brought to us in Eretz Israel. But for whatever reason, historical reasons, either because when Azoicha, as in the case of the Jewish people, because of other reasons, as in the case of Yaakov Avinu, part of his, part of his development process, and Maisa Abbas from Labani, right, to teach us how to live in Galus. So therefore, he goes there, the Shechina goes with him to help be paid to the Nitzotzi. And, and how does he do that? Well, first of all, he marries Ruch and Leah, right? Those are sparks he's being paid to right now, take them back there, just right with him. And from them comes all the Shvatim, at least, you know, all the Shvatim in the end. Right? And that's more Nitzotzi Kedush. And there's all the money he makes, takes back with him. And there's all the food that he consumed to do tar mitzvahs. Everything that Yaakov had to, to touch, to be involved with while living in Mesopotamia, in Padana Ram, with Lavan, by definition, was praying Nitzotzi. And since he's Kulotari, he's Ish Emes, 
everything he does, he does for the sake of, of serving Kodesh Baruch Hu. So therefore, it was all directly from the Klippos right back to Shemaim until the time comes that there are no more Natsotsim left. Right? And uh, perhaps he senses that because we know it doesn't go, no, no Galus goes on forever. That's what the Magdalene is telling him. And even the longest of, of Galus, the, the Edom, uh, you know, thousands of years, has to come to an end. You gotta you know, wake up and smell the coffee, as they say. You have to realize that even this Galus, which is Galus, Edom is going to come to an end. And Yishmael is sort of going to help that because we're not doing it on our own. So, so how, does, how does Yaakov know when it's time to go? Well, you know, it almost seems like he didn't, because all of a sudden, Pitom, right, suddenly he gets up and he runs away. And the Pasuk itself, the Torah itself, says that love and sent him, and he finally caught up and realized that, that Yaakov had taken off with his, with his daughters and his grandchildren and didn't even wait to say goodbye. Literally, seemingly, schemingly, taking advantage of Lavan's absence, who was shearing his sheep at the time, and then running off, right? And uh, I must have assumed that he would catch up to him at some point in time, which is a big question mark, too. But, uh, you know, he, you know, is it, you know this label of he, he stole the heart of Lavan. He stole the heart. Literally, he stole the lush, he stole. There's Yaakov once again being associated with theft. He steals the bruchas, right? Right from Asa. And now he steals the heart of Lavan. And, he, and he's held accountable. Lavan comes, he catches up, and he threatens to kill him, but Kush Boku you know, says, don't bother even you know, talking nasty to him because you know, he's, I'm, I'm work, he's doing the right thing of you know, Yaakov Avino. He did the right thing over here. The question is, why after 20 years did Yaakov feel compelled to have to run away so quickly? We know the answer now. The answer is because he was only there in the first place. Right? He was only there in the first place in order to be pulled in at Sotsu. He understood that. He knew the system. He knew how the world works. He knew what his job was in creation. He knew what Abraham did, what Yitzchak did, by making souls in Haran. Abraham was being put in the Tzotzi, the, the you know, Holy Sparks, and Yitzchak, through his Akedah, was a, a major redeemer of Holy Sparks in his life. And Yaakov was there to redeem Sparks. That's what we, that's what we Jews do. We Jews are spark redeemers. We're, that's our whole life, and our whole portion of what to come is based upon how many sparks we actually redeem. There's nothing, there's no other meaning in life besides that. We don't always see it, we get distracted by the actual means of doing it, the food that we eat. But, kadoshin to you, you have to be holy. Why do you have to be holy? What's important? Because God's holy. What does it mean? And it means basically that to be holy means to be focused on the fact that by redeeming holy sparks, we are fulfilling the purpose of my separation and being partners of the Kodesh Baruch Hu, in the completion of my sabrations. So Yaakov is waiting the entire time knowing there's going to come a day when the, the Shekhinah will no longer be here with me and protecting me. Because it's only here, as Eleshim explains, to help me do my job. To help me redeem the sparks that I've been sent here to redeem. Once those sparks are redeemed, then, then there's no point for the Shekhinah to be here. And if there's no point for the Shekhinah to be here, there's certainly no point for me to be here anymore. So Yaakov is living and waiting with the reality there will come a day when all the sparks he was meant to redeem have been redeemed, the Shekhinah the shekhin is going to move on, and, and he is going to have to move on too, and fast. Because if you stay a second longer than the Shekhinah, it means that the, the, the Kedusha that you're generating in the form of the Netzotzi Kedusha that you're elevating out from the Klippos, even doing the right thing is going to feed the other side and strengthen the other side. And if you keep strengthening the other side, eventually the other side turns against the Jewish people. It means Klai Yisrael, as we've seen over and over and over and over and over again. Countless times for the history. So Yaakov is very sensitive to that. So the moment that Yaakov notices the Shechina has moved on, he takes off. Doesn't wait to daven another mincha. Doesn't wait to wash and make a bruch and to yadayim and to bench after or to learn another, you know, shtikl gemurah, right? He moves on immediately. Why? Because the kedusha he's generating is going to feed the wrong side. And that's unacceptable. More serious than any danger that Lavan poses to him physically was the danger that Lavan and the reality of Lavan poses to him spiritually and the world spiritually. And that's why Yaakov is forced to leave so quick, so quickly. The question is, how did Yaakov know? Because we don't seem to know, but how did, how did Yaakov know? Is that the function of being a prophet? 
that you can figure out these things, but the rest of us are stuck in history, just waiting for it to end and then missing it and being caught up in the end of it and disastrously being destroyed in the process of it? You know, or is there something that Yaakov said that we, can, we could see too, and by seeing it, that would allow us to be able to survive godless as well? So the answer is right there, black and white, as clear as day in the Pesukim. It's not a sod, it's not Kabbalah, it's not even a remis. It's right there, black with shot right in the Chumash. What makes Yaakov decide to leave? It says, Yaakov comes home and he hears his brothers-in-law saying that Yaakov got rich off of our father. Oh, what a statement. First of all, aside from the fact it's totally untrue, and Yaakov doesn't really steal in the end, right? and Yaakov went out of his way to make love and rich, these guys, these two brothers-in-law, owe their lives to Yaakov Avinu. Because as Lavan points out, that the reason why Rochel was the one tending the sheep, because Lavan had no son. Before Yaakov came, Lavan had no sons. Period. So where did the sons come from? Well, the brocha of Yaakov living with Lavan brought Lavan some sons. So they owe, I mean, these guys, they, they owe their existence completely to, to Yaakov Avinu. Where's their course of toe? No, nope. but they're, they're greedy and they're jealous of things that are not even to be greedy and jealous about because Yaakov is prospering. Even though they've been a deal and Lavan can switch you to try and make money off Yaakov, but somehow they're broken to protecting him. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's the first thing. The second thing that tops it all off is the Torah tells us that Lavan did not smile the same way he did yesterday. You know, you know, before he had like a full smile, and then, you know, part you know, not, not exactly the same smile, you know. And that's a big deal. The Torah, it's such a big deal, the Torah writes about it. I mean, there must have been times that Lavan didn't smile exactly the same way he did in the past, but the Torah didn't talk about that. Only today, after that statement by the brothers, and then comes, comes Lavan's not smiling like yesterday, the Yankos says, okay, that's it. You know, Rojo, Leia, let's go. Pack up the bags. Get the family together. You know, you know, pack up the van. We're going. We're out of this place because these guys are no longer nice to us anymore. And your father is no longer as friendly as he once was. Are you sure? Maybe, maybe, maybe he has indigestion. Maybe he had a bad breakfast this morning. Maybe, maybe he lost money in the stock market. Maybe his son spoke back to him. Maybe his wife wasn't nice to him. Maybe his neighbor in corruption is low. No, there might be a thousand reasons. Did you ask him? Did you ask him why he wasn't as nice as yesterday? doesn't make a difference. Why? Because Yaakov understood that the civility that Lavan and his son showed to Yaakov all these years was not because he was a nephew or cousin, not because Lavan actually liked him as an employee or as part of the family, whatever, you know, as a son-in-law, but because the Shechina was there making Lavan like Yaakov. The Shechina was there to suspend the law of Halachahi that, that Esav or Lavan or whoever signed as Yaakov. Second of all, is that, you know, what's this Jew doing prospering amongst all these Gentiles? How do they stand for that? How do they put up, how do they even allow it to happen? Shechina. Because that prosperity is not Tzotzi Kedusha that's relevant specifically to the Jewish people. So therefore, even though the, the Gentile nation may not want to surrender that, and they don't understand a thing about Holy Sparks and how this, this furthers the cause of history and the completion of my Bereshis, it doesn't make a difference. The Shechina knows the truth. And therefore, Kosh Baruch will make it, the Jewish people will be successful to be able to do this. So if all of a sudden, if that's the reason for the success, if that's the reason for the security, and the lack of anti-Semitism is the Shechina. So therefore, it simply follows that if it turns out that the, that the protection that we've been enjoying up until now is beginning to dissipate even just a little bit, a little crack in the wall, and the water is like leaking through it just a little bit, you know, there's a huge amount of water behind this wall over here, that's anti-Semitism, of, of all the ages. And this wall is the Shechina. And if all of a sudden a little bit of water starts to, you know, to, to push through this wall with all that pressure behind the wall, so that implies the Shechina is no longer protecting the Jewish people as it once did. And why would, why would it not do that? You know, because it's moving on. Furthermore, if economically we're being affected as well, and there's a potential to lose that which we gave, as Yaakov saw from his brother-in-laws and what they said, right? So that's implying that the period of time of, of, of being paid, the Tzotzi Kedusha, is coming to a close. We've gotten all the sparks. 
We're supposed to get out, and if we're smart, we will get out now with what we've achieved and be successful, which is exactly what Yaakov Avinu was able to do. And he was almost like one of the last people historically who was able to do that. Because basically, the rest of history is about the Jewish people doing exactly what Yaakov did, coming in, surviving, and thriving, except not leaving early or on time as he did, and then losing everything along the way. Everything. Nothing left behind. That was what Yaakov Avinu understood. That's how Yaakov Avinu lived. That was the Maisa Avos Simon Labanim. They were supposed to learn from Yaakov Avinu in Galus. And here we are in the year 5070, 5772. We're very late in history. We've already gone through the, the proofs, or at least the evidence, that the events of today could certainly be Achris Yamin. We're holding it well into the 10th hour. Not too long from now, Techis is supposed to begin, which is after the fact. We'll talk about that more detail as well. Techis Amazing. understand why Mashiach is not going to come in that period of time, but that period of time comes after Mashiach has already come and done his work and rectified the world. Right and and the events of today, economies are collapsing or on the verge of collapse. You know this whole thing with Greece is like a thread in your jacket. You start to pull, and all of a sudden it's not stopping. It's just going. It's pulling more thread and more thread. Before you know it, you keep going. The entire sleeve comes off, which might be America, it might be you know other countries like England and, and and Russia. Who knows who else will be affected, impacted by this entire economy? But one thing is for sure: when there are money problems in the world. The Jewish people are going to be blamed. When the anti-Semitism returns to the world, it usually gets worse before it gets better. And since, as we said before, anti-Semitism is not racism, it is a divine sign that history is going back to the way it naturally is until Mashiach comes. That's the mistake that we make. Halachahi, Esav, Son, Es Yaakov is telling you it's the most. It's as natural for the the Gentile to hate the Jew as it is for grass to grow from the ground that's been watered and to be green and the sky to be blue or rain to fall when the, when the, when the barometer drops and all these natural things and for the sun to, ro- you know, to, to rotate and for the, or the sun rotate? No, but the earth revolves around the sun and the moon rotates, right? And uh, revolves, goes around the earth, you know, and, and et cetera, et cetera, whatever. There's this natural world out there. Water flows downstream. Salmon, for some reason, go upstream. But uh, the water itself flows downstream. It's a natural world with natural laws, one of which is the Gentiles are not going to like the Jewish people until Mashiach comes. There'll be exceptions. There's always going to be righteous Gentiles. There's going to be B'nai Noach who are going to live by Torah and support the Jewish people and want to attach themselves to Torah and the Jewish people. But the rest of the world... Not into it. Not, not crazy about us. And certainly B'nai Ishmael, not into us, and certainly not crazy about us, and planning on a daily basis. But they were quite, they kept quiet for the longest time. And we were able to build this country against all the odds. Literally. I mean, to fight so many battles in such a, you know, a smaller population, to be able to accomplish what we've accomplished in seven years and build the place up as we have. Because all the Nadots of Kedusha that were here for thousands of years that had to be redeemed by the Jewish people. And yet the situation becoming more tenuous and financially the Jewish people are being more squeezed. These are all simanim that Yaakov have been used specifically to understand that the Galus is coming to an end. What are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to go where the Shekhin is going. We're supposed to move on. So where are we supposed to go? <laughs> well, we've you know, been there, done that. We've, we've already gone to the four corners of the earth. All the curses of the Jewish people in the, in, the, in the Torah have all come true. The land was remembered as promised. It's grown and developed to unbelievable you know, levels of success, miraculously, clearly miraculously, regardless of who did it, but you know, it's, just, it's clear for all to see. Right? Where's the Shekhinah today? There's only one place. It's not going to the moon. It's not going to Anchorage, Alaska. It's not going to the desert, because the lesson points of the desert is not a place of sparks. It's where they're stored, but that's not where they're, they're meant to come up, because what Gomorrah says, only the places of Adam was Kovei, he established his dwelling places. Those are the dwelling places of history, at least until Mashiach comes. So it's all been done. Everything is in place. The only thing missing is Kalah Yisrael, the Jewish people. And we are facing a situation as the sparks begin to run out in America and Canada and England and everywhere else, but Eretz Israel, where they just keep coming up more and more, because here's where they are, and they're coming to us now. Not only are we, you know, we're, we're returning ourselves, 
but as we return, the Kish Baruch Hu is helping us by bringing the sparks in different means in, in terms of money or in terms of, you know, produce, whatever the case may be, but Kish Baruch Hu, it could be a dust storm. He brings the Tzotzi. There's lots of ways to bring the Tzotzi in Beis Yisrael. But as they run out in Chutzlarts, then the Shechina moves on, all of a sudden, Jews will find themselves unprotected. Chas but unprotected. And when that happens, we see how far the Gentiles can go to carry out what they plan to do to us. What do we have to do? So, Bazar Hashem, that's, that's the topic of the next discussion, the emanation program. What Gu'ulu Barachim has to become, what we have to do with the material and the ideas in order to be able to avert a crisis and hopefully bring the Gu'ulu Bazar Hashem Barachim. As David Melech said, Atata kum dechem siyon. You will get up on Kosh Baruch and you will show mercy to Siyon. Because the time to favor the appointed time will have come. Because, because what? Because your servants, they want your stones, they cherish your dust. Interesting, the Pasuk should talk in terms of stones and dust, as if something's inside them that is valuable. Stones and dust, it's just a metaphor? No, because in that stone and dust, that was Eretz Yisrael. That was Eretz Yisrael. For thousands of years, stone and dust. Not much more than that. But by cherishing that, by realizing inside that stone and dust is Natsotzi Kedusha, and then coming back and mining those Natsotzi Kedusha and, and, and making the desert bloom. That's what, that's what it means. The desert is the, the stones and the dust. Right? And blooming is the trees and the grass and all the life we brought to this country. Where did it come from? How do you make a desert bloom? Okay, so you bring the watering and the whole thing with that that's technology, but, but te- now, how do you make a desert bloom? Many tried. And they've been unsuccessful. They come here for the technology. And they're not as successful back home probably with it than they are here because it's not just, you know, grass and vegetables and lettuce and all, you know, cut salads are growing over here. But it's also the Tzotzi Kedusha that have been waiting for thousands of years to come out. The time has come and we're doing it. The Gula is at hand. Because we much closer than we think. And the Jew, safety for the Jew is defined as not being far from the conflict but being where God wants you to be when he wants you to be there. And where he wants you to be always is where the Tzotzi Kedusha are, the ones that we're relevant to, to bring us.